hello, hello. This is Marshall Goldsmith. Welcome to LinkedIn Live. We have a wonderful, wonderful show today. Uh, we're going to be talking about designing the life and the work that you love. And we have the two world's experts, one on designing your life and one on designing your business. And they're both here in the same room. So life is indeed good. I'm going to briefly introduce myself. Then we're going to go to my wonderful comrade, Sun Yin. And then after that, we'll have our two fine guests get, get rolling here. So I'm Marshall. I'm from Kentucky. I went to school in Indiana. I got a PhD at UCLA. I was a college professor and dean. I traveled around the world giving talks and teaching classes. Been to 102 countries. I um, coached executives. I've been the coach of CO Ford and Pfizer and I'm Glaxo and the World Bank and all kinds of wonderful people. And that's where I learned everything. And then I write books and articles. So I've written or edited 41 books. I've done six bestsellers and then 35 purchased by my mother and my father and associated relatives. So uh, life is good. And also one thing I'm most proud of is I went to a program put on by this wonderful woman named Aisha Purcell. I, I, I forget where she is right now. Wonderful, wonderful woman, Aisha Purcell. It was called Design the Life You Love. And she, she asked me who my heroes were and she inspired me to, to try to be more like my heroes. And I came up with an idea of, I said, I'm going to adopt 15 people, teach them all I know for free. And when they get old, they have to do the same thing. I made a little video and put it here on LinkedIn. And I thought 100 people would apply. Well, so far, over 18,000 people have applied. And it's just an amazing community, which would not have happened without her, of course. And so uh, three of the proud members of our group, that at least that I'm proud of, are right here right now with Sonia and Aisha and Alex. And before we get started, let me introduce my great Kanye, uh, comrade, Sonia and Shank. Now, I used to be the Thinkers 50 number one executive coach ranked in the whole world for many years, but now they put me in the Hall of Fame. That's where they put the old people. So now I'm the used to be number one. And the new number one uh, Thinkers 50 coach is my wonderful friend, Sonia and Chang. Sonia is wonderful. Sonia, introduce yourself in a couple of minutes and then, and then you can introduce, uh, you introduce uh, Aisha and I'll introduce Alex. How's that? That sounds great, Marshall. And importantly, audience members, please put your questions and your thoughts into the comment boxes uh, below the screen. And what we promise you towards the end of the show, we will get to your questions for um, Aisha and for Alex. And also, if you like something that you're hearing, remember to click that like or love button. Um, so when Marshall bursts into song, for example, be sure to click that like button, okay? And um, hi everyone, I'm Sun Yin Shang. I am um, designated by Thinkers50 as the world's number one executive coach. And I work with board directors, CEOs, military generals, and students because I'm also the executive director of Duke University's Coach K Center on Leadership and Ethics at its Fuqua School of Business. And I'm also a very proud mom. Now, if you can't tell, I can't stop smiling today. And I can't stop smiling because we have two of my favorite people all in the show today. So I'm going to introduce Aisha Brazil. Okay, so, all right. And, and the hard part for me is to keep this brief. <laughs> I could just talk on and on about Aisha. So Aisha is one of Fast Company, most creative people in the world. And when her name is mentioned in the design world and in business, people just light up because Aisha is also deeply profound and wise. Every time we talk, I learn something from her. She is also the world's, of course, number one life design coach and the author of one of my favorite books, Design the Life You Love. And this book is so unlike any other book you've ever read because look, it's got her brilliant, um, it's a mix of visual delights, workbooks, and deep questions. <laughs> um, and every time I talk to Aisha, I love from her. All right, so, um, okay, we could go on and on, but I'm gonna turn it over to Michael now to introduce Alex. And I'm here introducing my comrade. Before that, uh, Aisha is also my coach. She's been coaching me to redesign my own life. So yesterday she was coaching me for uh, quite a while. So she's wonderful. You can coach me, you can coach anybody. So that's the ultimate compliment right now. Now I'm here, I'm here to introduce our good, our good friend, Alex Osterwalder. Alex is just a wonderful person. He's ranked number four overall management and business figure in the entire world. And I think he's by far the youngest on the list. I mean, most of the people on the list are his old people. 
And, you know, but again, so Alex, see, the good news is you're on the list. The bad news is you're not going to be in the Hall of Fame forever. You're just not old enough. He's the author of four big, big selling books, including The Invincible Company. And he's the developer of the business model Canvas. Also, he's also a great guy, very smart, creative guy, always trying new things. So we've got a couple of wonderful, wonderful guests. Uh, let's get rolling. Let's get rolling. Um, we're going to start by asking this question to uh, Aisha. And why is it important to design the life you love? Marshall, thank you. And you are a great designer of life, so you, you know the answer to this. But the reason that this is important yeah. is you want to be able to deconstruct your life, look at the pieces, and then put it back together in a new way. And this allows you to really understand um, what are the essential pieces of your life? What are the things that you want to change? The things that you want to avoid or delete and put it back together. And from that, create an original life, a life that resembles you, looks like you, and meets, kind of meshes with your values. That's why you need to design your life. You know, give me one reflection that you've had because you've been doing this now with a lot of people. One reflection for our, our observers, our viewers, you know, about what have you learned from watching people try to design their own lives, including me and Sonia and all the people on this call? That's a great question, Marshall. One thing that I've learned, and you know, I've helped thousands of people across the globe design their lives. Uh, the youngest, ones were 13 and actually um, Alex's daughter was one of my youngest students. She came to my session with my daughter. They were both, when they were both 13. And then the oldest is 90 plus. So anyone can design their life. And what I've learned from them is that people are extraordinarily creative, but they simply need a process. So what I do is I provide deconstruction, reconstruction, which is my design thinking process to everyone and anyone can design their life. I love it. Oh. Sonia, what's a good question for our comrade Alex? Well, let's take the idea of process to enable anyone to design the life they love. And so Alex, you are also a master of process creation. What is design the business you love? So it's actually the, the same process, and I've learned a lot from Aisha, you know, applying it to, to my own life. But when you create a business as an entrepreneur, you're designing something, right? You're designing an object. It just happens to be a, a social object, a business. And I think sometimes we make too many compromises and we don't design the kind of business we want to really create. You know, a great workplace with the right kind of culture. It's not something you should let happen. You should create it. That is as, a, as an entrepreneur. But if you are a senior leader, you know, you might have influence over a lot of people. So I believe, you know, you have a really big responsibility to design a great business as well. Because it's not just about creating value for customers and creating value for uh, your organization. It's also about creating value for your team and for society. Right? So that's, you know, what you can do as a senior leader. And maybe on a smaller scale, if you're a team lead or, you know, you work uh, in, in groups, you should design the kind of business environment, the kind of business working culture you want to create. I think there's a huge responsibility there. And sometimes we just don't realize that we can actually design and manage uh, social systems as well. So you know, the same principles that we see in designing objects or designing our life, that was a big revelation for, for me, you know, reading Aisha's book. And um, the same thing can be actually applied to business. You know, listening yeah. to both of you, um, Oh, I was just going to say, in this notion of design is a sense of you can architect what you just said, um, Alex, is that you can architect your future, you can architect your company, you can architect your life. And in that architecture, that design sense is a sense of agency, is a sense of agency. So, uh, Marshall, uh, back to you. You know, I got a question. Uh, Justin, uh, our buddy Justin from Methods is here, and they do a great job of sponsoring all of our programs and putting all this stuff on. I got a question for the audience. There's this quote, and it relates to something that Alex just said. 
And that is the only way to predict the future is to create it. Now, I've heard this quote attributed to about seven different people. Who the hell said this anyway? The only way to predict the future is to create it. I want, I want Justin, that's a, a question for our listeners. Send in your idea. Who said this damn quote anyway? Because I hear it, everybody in the world. So I have everybody send in their ideas. Who said this? Just, just you can accumulate. I, I'll ask some questions, but be accumulating some of the answers. I, you know, you know, Sonia, and I've been Mar thinking Marshall, about it. Marshall, Marshall, Marshall. I, I love how you are turning this into now a trivia show. So I love it. <laughs> I and you know, and you know, uh, I say now that I think about it, and Sonia, I think the quote must have come from me. I think maybe I was the guy that. <laughs> <laughs> so, now I have a question for both of you. Why is understanding this concept of design, why is understanding the concept or the principles of design, why is that it's so important in life and in business? So this time we'll start with Alex and then go back to Aisha. Cool. Well, I, you know, we sometimes think, uh, you know, institutions are so, they just happen. And, and the design process is something you can learn. So it's that aspect that I think is really important and is completely underestimated. And, you know, design thinking is now in business is, is pretty popular, but I don't think we're really good at it yet. We almost need to see it like a, a profession, right? You're designing things is not just about creative genius. It is really about process. And too many people think they can get away with, oh, you know, I don't do that kind of stuff or that's not me. It's a process that you can learn. So you can't just throw away that responsibility. You have the obligation or maybe even, you know, moral obligation to design the kind of business you want to see. Um, so I think it's something you can learn. And uh, a lot more business leaders should actually uh, go on that uh, designing track. So definitely something uh, we shouldn't just neglect as a nice to have. It's core of the kind of workplaces and businesses we want to create. And as you said, you know, it allows us to design the future. So it's something we should really actively take into our hands. Right. How about you, Aisha? I love what you said, Alex, and it truly is that. And when it comes to designing your life, it's applying design process to your life. And the reason for that is I think our life is our biggest project. I mean, I've designed products and systems and services for large Fortune 500 companies. And I usually tell my friends, you've probably sat in, in one of my either office systems or toilets. And it's kind of like the two ends of the scale. But the really the, the, gist, the gist of it is to be able to turn challenges into opportunities. I mean, design is a very positive discipline. It's about improving people's lives. So designing your life with design tools allows you to take challenges, turn them into opportunities and improve your life. And wouldn't we want to, to do that? Well, you know, very, very important point, Aisha. Many people may not know that you are the queen of toilet design as well. So you have designed, designed furniture, you have designed toilets. So I'm, I'm glad you shared with, that with the group because uh, they, people may not have known that important fact about you. Now, you did an exercise to change and now my the, life. The whole, the whole world knows. Now the whole world Thanks knows. Thanks to you, Marshall. Now the whole world knows. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> this is called design the toilet that you love. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's called this, actually it's called this, design the life you love before your life goes down the toilet. Ah, oh, you even like it better. <laughs> I have a, I have a question. <laughs> okay, so now you've given us the what, what is design the life and the business you love, and then you've given us the why, you know, the so what. Now, can both of you give us a just one key thing that our viewers who are listening in today can get started in terms of taking action for designing the life or the business that they love? Alex, you go yeah, first. Sonia. Okay, go ahead. I've got one for Sonia later. I mean, I've got one for Aisha later. Let Alex go first. 
Yeah, so, you know, I think sometimes um, business people mistake business as, you know, purely decision making. But I think the world is getting so complex that the what is actually more about creating the, di the, the, the conditions and the context for people to prosper, for your teams to prosper, for the great ideas to emerge. Now, the question is, what can you do? I work on innovation, so I'll give an example there. What can you do as a leader, as a business person, as an entrepreneur to actually, you know, let innovation happen in your organization? Well, first thing is very simple. Just tear down all of the boundaries, all of the obstacles that are holding people back from innovating. Because one of the things I believe sincerely is that no company has an, an, an innovation talent problem. They don't have a people problem. They have a process problem or a context problem. So what you need to do as a leader is look at all of the things that are holding people back from doing great work, or if you're looking at innovation, from actually you know, trying to explore new ideas. Because the principles there are very different. You need to experiment a lot. You're going to fail a lot. You're going to learn a lot. You're going to change your idea a lot. So it's very different from planning. So as a leader, you just need to start to kill those obstacles that are holding people back from doing great work. And automatically, you'll have great teams, great people, and great ideas emerge and come to success. So I think there's a, there's a pretty big shift there in leadership. You can design the context for your team to prosper. It's not about picking ideas or picking people. It's about creating the conditions. And that's a design process. Context is so Very important. Good. Thank you, Alex, for having us. Now, now I say I'm going to bias your thinking here. You came up with one very clear tool that changed my life. I want you to share that with the group. Share this heroes exercise that you did, which was a great design principle that changed my life. Great. Marshall, great minds think alike. I was going to talk about heroes, so thank you for biasing me without even knowing that I was going to do that. But I think it's really the magical tool in my toolbox is heroes. And it's about asking yourself who your heroes or role models are. And Marshall, in your case, when I asked you this question, you thought of all the amazing teachers that you've had in your life from Francis Hasselbein to Alan Mulally to Jim Kim to Boot. But what you do is you think of your heroes and then you think about what is it about them that inspire you? And for Marshall, it was how his teachers taught him everything they know without anything, without asking for anything in return. And that's exactly the insight that you're looking for. What, what is it that inspires you about your heroes? You write, write those down. And then I turn the tables on you and I basically tell you that what you recognize in your heroes are your own values. And so to own those values, and in Marshall's case, I told him, hey, um, that's who you are. You want to teach everything you know to others without anything asking for uh, in return. And from that, MG100 was born. So Marshall, how was that? Is that a good description of the hero's exercise? There you go. Very, very, very good. Very good. Now I've got one Thank for you, Alex. Tanya. Alex, I have a question for you. I'm writing this new book, The Earned Life, and Sonia and I, we're, we're in, and I think you guys might be in this LPR process where people talk about their lives every week and then this red, yellow, green thing. I have found, Alex, it is phenomenally difficult for people to just say, I failed. I mean, it is so hard. Instead of just saying, I failed, people say, well, yes, I said I would do something last week and I didn't do it, but it's really because I'm a hero, I'm hardworking, I'm dedicated, I had to take care of my children, my mother died, or some, you know, blah, 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 blah. There's always some story. It's very hard for people to just say, you know what? I set a goal last week. Let's tell the truth. I failed. I just failed. I find that just unbelievably difficult for people to do. And I think one reason Alan Mulally is such an amazing leader is he creates an environment where people can do it. So question number one, Alex, why is it so hard for all of us? I'm not exempting myself. I'm certainly in the same category. 
why is it so hard for all of us to just say, you know what, I screwed up? I think it's a that's a wonderful question. I think it's a cultural challenge to a certain extent, right? We we like you know putting people on the cover of the magazine, and then we always only see the shiny part. <laughs> what we don't see is behind the success that you you know see on the cover of the magazine or in a TV show or so. We don't see the trail of failure that actually led to that success. We don't see you know the learning, sometimes the suffering that people went through to get there. Now, of course, there are exceptions. Some people they just get lucky and they succeed. But in most cases, it's really a long trajectory of trying out things and looking silly many, many times until you look smart. So the challenge is maybe to, to you know, promote a little bit more that failures, you know, nobody, nobody likes failure. And if you take Jeff Bezos, founder of Amazon, he likes to say failure is terrible, but you can't innovate, you can't create something big without accepting that you're going to have thousand failures. So he likes to say, that you know, the one big success actually happens because we have thousands of failures. So I do think we need to cherish not the failure per se, but the fact that the success comes from a whole you know, uh, a, a long trail of experiences that you have to go through. And that is the part that we don't, you know, don't show enough. And in companies, that is you know, a, a difficult thing, even in, in, in countries. So you know, I, like, I like to quote my friend Steve Blank, who invented this whole lean startup movement coming out of Silicon Valley. He likes to say there's one thing that Silicon Valley is pretty good at. And there's a lot of things we can probably criticize, but there's one thing they're good at. They have a particular name for failure. They call it experience, right? In Switzerland, is the contrary where I come from. You know, you have failure, it's going to be, you know, something you're carrying with you for a very long time. But, you know, take venture capitalists, they don't like investing in young entrepreneurs who've never tried and failed because they will make the mistakes that more experienced entrepreneurs won't make. So we need to see failure not as a good thing, but as experience, right? Something you're never going to do again. Because you can't teach, you know, you can't, <laughs> you're going to learn how to ride a bicycle by falling down a couple of times. So it's, it's really putting that that experience at the center of our attention, not the failure per se. And that will shift things pretty dramatically because then we'll see that success is not something that happens just overnight, but it's a long kind of trail of experience, which includes tons of failure. Mm, very um, good. Alex, now, before we, get questions, before we get into questions from the, uh, from the audience, you know, I, you know, Sonia, and I can see why I was always ranked number one. Unlike those other people that Alex talked about who fail and never do it again, I have the incredible gift of failing the same things over and over and over again. <laughs> so I'm, I'm not one of those like quick learners that he's talking about. Yeah, I just, I just but screw up. Right? And then tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Justin. Is Justin there? Justin, do we have a great question from the from the audience? Justin, we can't hear you. Justin, we can't hear you. Hello? Justin, we can't hear you. Am I clear? Right. Yes. Now okay. you are. Okay, Marshall, uh, circle now, Justin, back on the uh, we, we, poll we, we all love you, that you had asked we, the we audience you, earlier, which was... Mm -hmm. um, the only way to predict the future is to create it. And you asked who said this. So we got a, a few answers coming in. Uh, we have three people that uh, give credit to Abraham Lincoln. One person, Andrew Nowak says Peter Drucker. Uh, Yatoka, Yatika says Dennis Gabor, a physicist. And we had William H who says, I don't know, someone with a lot of money. So those are our guesses so far. Anybody right? <laughs> look, look, I'm going with Abraham Lincoln. You know why? I'm his damn cousin. His grandmother was my long ago great, great grandfather, great, 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 great grandmother. So we're going with Abraham Lincoln. He's my cousin. He's the guy that said it from here on in. All the Peter Drucker, phony, phony. It was Abraham Lincoln that did it. Let's, let's hear it from my you. cousin. I challenge, I challenge you. <laughs> okay. <well. laughs> Peter Drucker. <laughs> okay. Okay, I'm going with Abraham Lincoln. He was before Peter Drucker. Yeah, I don't know if you know this. Abraham Lincoln was a president of the United States long ago. He's a very, very large fellow. Now, okay, Justin, Justin, give us our first question. Okay, we got a bunch of great questions here. And I just want to say uh, we keep a tight 30 minute schedule. So just know that even if we can't ask your question uh, and answer it live on air, 
Uh, our host, Marshall Sanyin, and our guests, uh, Aisha and Alex, are definitely going to go through the comments and respond to those later. So if we don't get to your question live on air, just know that we are listening to you. We do see that, and you will get a response on those, on those questions. So first one comes from uh, Brian Wallace in Houston, Texas. And he asks, space. there's these diagrams behind you. What are they? I didn't get it. Did you hear Alex's that? Alex's diagram. I didn't hear it. The question. Uh, the diagram. Uh, okay, Alex. What's so behind you? That's that's good. That allows me to do a little bit of book marketing. So what you see behind me is actually a design process. When we create books, we design them. So all of these things here are are spreads, book pages from our recent book called The Invincible Company. So uh, we work really like the designers. I, I don't write books, and my team and myself, we actually craft book, books with a design process. Excellent. Okay, Justin, question number two. Hey, next one is from Washington, D.C. This one comes from Josephine. Uh, she says, uh, it is true that anyone can visualize how they want to see their future, but the problem uh, is in implementing this process. So do you have any tips on actual implementation? Okay, Aisha, you do this one. I'll do this one. So that that's a great uh, question. And the implementation is what I find is designers get excited by ideas. And once they're excited by an idea, they're really driven to make it happen, to bring it to life. So what's important is doing enough permutations of ideas, different combinations of possibilities and developing these concepts for your life or your product or your service until there's one that really excites you and draws your attention because it's an elegant solution. And once you have that, you can really go and implement it in the way to implement like uh, what Marshall did. I think the reason that he developed Marshall Goldsmith 100 coaches idea was among all his ideas that that really struck him as something that was exciting, teaching other people everything he knows. And that drove him to take the next steps. Um, so the next steps are Include your friends and your family in your idea because they're your collaborators and design ideas really come to life when you're collaborating. Make your idea public. Once you make it public, chances are you need to follow through. So that, that also hugely helps. Um, in Marshall's case, he made it public on, on LinkedIn. And once you do that, you'll find it's hard to go back. And then maybe the third piece is to try by testing. So in, once you have the idea, what designers usually do, and Alex knows this very well, you don't put all your risk into one bucket. You try in small doses. So you first do a quick mock-up, you test it, and then you refine that, and then you take the next step. So I would suggest that whatever your idea is, test, refine, test, refine in small doses and then get better and better at it. And in closing, finally, thank you to Sanyin, my wonderful comrade. Thank you, Sanyin, you're wonderful. Thank you to Aisha, who's coaching me. Thank you, thank you. Thank you to Alex, who somehow got invited to be on the call with the rest of us. I'm not sure how, but you're here anyway. So thank you. <laughs> thank you, Alex. Oh, Alex. <laughs> so anyway, wonderful. Thank Thanks to everybody. You. In. Thanks to everybody for tuning in. Uh, love everybody and um, see you at the next time. Bye-bye.